welcome again to another episode of SLMA Radio. An ongoing series of episodic shows brought to you by the Funnel Radio Network for at-work listeners like you. Today we're talking with our host, Laura Patterson, host of the Ready, Set, Grow segment, where she interviews C-level executives from across various industries to discuss how they've organically grown their company. These tell-all programs will focus on revealing the tools and management techniques they're using today to fuel their above-average growth. So without further ado, let's get started. Welcome, Laura. Welcome to the Ready, Set, Grow SLMA radio show, where we gain insights and wisdoms from members of the C-suite on how to grow organically, the role they expect marketing to play in growth, and how they will measure marketing's contribution to growth. Thanks for joining us. If you've missed any of our prior episodes, you can always catch the replays, and we've been really fortunate to have some amazing guests. Ziggy Shanklin, CEO of White Cloud Security, J.T. McCormick, CEO of Scribe Media, Dave Sakura of Alter, uh, Kevin Jones, and today I am really, really delighted to have Mark Hafner, CEO of Revionics, as my guest. Mark and I actually go back a long way, and we'll try not to bore you with any uh, <laughs> stories and keep focused on the topic at hand. So Mark is an award-winning CEO. He has more than 25 years' experience successfully driving leading growth for organizations ranging from startups to large Fortune 500 uh, divisions. He has a strong track record of building growth and value for stakeholders, and he considers stakeholders investors, employees, and customers. He's developed strategies and led organizations to compete effectively and win globally against the best, against companies such as Oracle, IBM, SAP, uh, HP, Dell, EMC, Alcatel, and Cisco, and of course, all of our favorites, Microsoft. He's got a passion beyond uh, being a CEO. Mark, being here in Austin, partakes in our music community and plays rock and roll guitar with his band Lost in Austin. He rocks at such events as NRF's Rock and Roll Retail and Revionics Insight. Speaking of Revionics, uh, we are in their beautiful city uh, facility right here on Lake Austin, and it is the global SaaS provider of retail price and promotion optimization. Mark, Thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you. Good to see you again. Really good to see you too. Really excited about having an opportunity to capture your thoughts. Folks I know will gain a great deal from your wisdom. So I thought we should start off with just a basic conversation about where is organic growth on your priority list here at Revionics? Sure. Well, organic growth is very high on my list and, and, uh, Organic growth is where you create the, establish the foundation for the company's future growth plans. It's extremely critical that you get that right first and foremost before attempting any grand in organic growth plans. So that's uh, where I start every day, my focus on. Awesome. I, I'm really excited to hear that. And I'm not surprised to hear that. When companies are taking your advice and focusing on organic growth, what do you think are the biggest challenges they're going to have to f- overcome? Well, first of all, you got to remember that organic growth occurs in stages. It doesn't occur all at once. And folks can be too quick to expand without building a strong foundation and culture to begin with to support that growth down the road. You must be measured in your growth plans. You plan for success, but you don't get yourself so far over your skis that if your forecasted growth should not hit the levels that you, you anticipated that you don't create other problems for your, your company. For example, when I came into Revionics, we were very focused on North America and North America only. And the reason was is that I believed it important to prove out our customer acquisition, our implementations, our growing the business in North America first before we went overseas because it's much more expensive when you leave the, the, the base of operations that you've started in. So we did that, and now we're, we're growing very rapidly in Europe and in Latin America and Asia Pacific. Another challenge that I would say for growth companies is make sure you have the right processes in place. So many times you run hard and fast and you leave those little details behind. And if you don't build a business with strong processes, you, you, you can't just throw people at it. That won't fix problems. So you gotta, you gotta make sure that you take the time to build, build out your processes as you're growing the company. 
And as such, we're constantly reviewing and refining and adapting new processes to our business. And frankly, that's one thing that I think we could always still do a better job of as we grow. And then finally, I think you have to do what I call review game film. All successful sports organizations, business organizations are successful because they're willing to accept that they're not perfect and go back and review what happened, make changes as necessary, move on. And so I think that's one thing that we don't do. So I have, I have a phrase around here. It's, I have lots of phrases around the company. I say we review game film. And by the way, we review game film on things that are good and we review things that are, that are bad. And it's only to make it better. It's not to look for fault. It's only to make it better. So if companies don't do this uh, in, in growth mode, you're going to stall out. You know, I think these are three really great suggestions. I know your experience tells you how important they are. And I think you're right. A lot of people do forget some of these basics, particularly about, you know, growing. Don't get in front of your skis. I love that. It's a great phrase. And processes. I am always amazed at how many companies sort of put that on the back burner. Mm -hmm. The whole, well, you know, my background at Motorola, all about Six Sigma you know, we can process math in our sleep. Right. Well, it's actually how the defense industry, so that's where I cut my teeth, and that's where all processes came from, too, as well for me. So you were talking about these three things, but I also want to talk about something else that I know is really important to you, and that's culture. Mm -hmm. That's always every organization that I've ever seen you be in, that's Mm -hmm. something that's been top of mind for you. So I wanted to talk a little bit about culture and what you feel, what kind of culture you think is vital Mm -hmm. for a company that's going to focus on our granite growth. Mm Mm-hmm. For me, hands down, it's got to be an open culture. You have to be able to listen to others. You have to be able to collaborate and then innovate from those. It will help to have much closer to the microphone. And too many times I see people walking around the building in, in prior prior organizations I've been in where they thought they had the idea or the only idea. And frankly, that closed-mindedness is what usually left and led to something that didn't work as well as it should. So it's really important for a culture to be open and collaborative and, and have people work together. For, for most definitely. That's, that's number one. The locker room is important to me, as I said. Yes. And, you know, but we can say we won't go back to the, that time when there were a lot of young people mm-hmm. running companies here mm-hmm. in Austin. Mm-hmm in the days when mushrooms were popping up, like, yeah, <laughs> you're smiling, remember. can remember. Uh, yeah. And and I think about the, your thought about that really great idea and, and you know, let's just make it work. And it wasn't, people didn't really know how to manage right. and they didn't really know how to create a culture. Yeah. And people jump so quickly to, well, here's the business model. And we're just going to work hard and it'll happen. No, it doesn't happen that way. Exactly. And, and as I tell people every day, everything we accomplish is through people. So we got to keep that in mind. Everything we accomplish is through people. You're exactly right. Although, before long, we may have want to talk about AI and robotics and all that. But we want not today because you're not allowed to get me off on a tangent. <laughs> 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 all right. But we will save that. We'll save that for uh, some, another time. But if we're talking about culture and the things that make an organization be successful at organic growth, let's talk about something that um, is I'm passionate about, as you know, is marketing. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's where I've spent you know, most of my career is in the realm of marketing. So tell me what you think uh, is marketing's role in driving organic growth and how well do you think in general marketing professionals play in this role? That's a great question. I, marketing is indispensable in every aspect of the CMOs today are accountable to drive revenues and retain customers, increase margins, manage and define the brand generate and nurture leads. The positioning and messaging that sets the tone for the first impressions with all of our constituents, be it customers, investors, industry analysts, employees, and partners, and even the media. Marketing must understand, analyze, and influence the market in order to be able to generate relevant content. And if there's any time left in the day for marketing at that point, after that, marketing helps drive the engagement throughout the customer acquisition, starting with influencers such as the media and industry analysts, and then having a sound SEO program. So, you know, when you're talking about all those things, that's a really, I mean, that's a huge list you just had, and you're not even done talking about it. No, no, that's, <laughs> that's, 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 that's your point to lunch. Yeah, and so when you think about that, it's really hard for uh, these organizations that put in a marketing person or a sure. few marketing people, and most of them are very tactically oriented, right? Uh, or they might have one quarterback and then yeah. very lean teams. I, I know exactly what you're talking about. You're, you know, when you're in a startup mode, that is where you are having to execute on. 
right? Yeah. And, and let, let's be honest, from a startup mode, the first thing you're doing is building up the product and proving the business case. Now it's about the execution on the top line growth. And so I would dare say, uh, it's been a long time since I've run a very small startup, but I dare say that marketing is not the first person that's being hired in startups today. But as you look at growth mode, they're absolutely, without a doubt, in, incredibly important to making it that bridge from R and D and product, uh, you know, proof points to now gain to the market and go on the top line. You can't do that. When I came in to Ravionics, we had uh, one marketing person, and we were not a startup, but we weren't as big as we are today. Uh, now I don't know what it's a dozen, close to a dozen folks, and, and it, it's it's something that's important. And then when you take your company like we did, and you go from North America and you go to a global perspective. It's fun. It's challenging, but it's fun too. So, what's been interesting is to watch this global marketing team and how they work together to bring in the the global perspective. So, for example, in about two weeks, we have our huge annual customer conference uh, this year around in Chicago because we have it here in facilities here in Austin. And our marketing team is not focused on what people are doing on the East Coast or West Coast of the U.S. They're, they're going to be talking about Russia. They're going to be talking about Brazil and so forth in, uh, in Australia. This is a global perspective of now how my marketing team looks at our business game. And, that, and that's true in, in how we even measure our marketing business. I mean, we, we look at specific growth opportunities so we can improve. For example, one of the things that we do, I don't know, you're very big into analytics and marketing. Yes, that's my thing. That's, that's, that's your, that's your so, so the things that, for example, we look at is that we're pragmatic. What's the phrase you use? Vanity? Uh, well, you're talking about vanity metrics. Vanity metrics. Well, we don't, we don't, well, we don't like those. I know. That's <laughs> we don't like those. When we study in our pipeline, simple details is how long did something sit at a particular point in stage, and then we start digging in from a marketing perspective, working back with the field teams. What can we do to improve that? That's act. That's where you take a proactive approach to your analytics. I agree with you. And with that, we're going to take a small break. Turn our our uh, time over to the producers, but we'll be right back. Stay tight. <laughs> And just a short reminder of the people bringing you this program today, Vision Edge Marketing. They work with chief executive, financial, marketing, growth, strategy, and customer insight officers like you in the manufacturing, technology, financial services, medical devices, life sciences, transportation, logistics, really, you name it, they do it. People rely on them for their expertise to make more effective and faster fact-based decisions. That's the key, fact-based decisions. What are the facts? How do we use them to make decisions regarding customers, markets, products, and competition that's always knocking at your door? They show you how to improve and prove the value of marketing and leverage data analytics processes and measurements to increase marketing's relevance and ability to deliver the greater impact you're looking for. That's what it's all about. Don't just generate more leads. Show how it's relevant and show how it turns into results. If that's what you're looking for, then you need a vision. How about visionedgemarketing.com? Go there to find out more. Visionedgemarketing.com. All right, let's pick it back up with our host, Laura, and her guest. So we're back with Mark Hafner, CEO of Revionics, and having a conversation about the role marketing plays in growth. We were just delving into all the facets of marketing and how important it is to be able to dig into why something may have occurred and figure out how to address it or if it's something that's going well, how to reproduce it. Mm -hmm. So we were into measurement. But one of the things I wanted to ask you, Mark, is how do you think marketers in general are doing as a discipline uh, in their ability to contribute to growth? First of all, I guess the way I would say it is that uh, I can't speak for all marketers, but the perspective I would take, Laura, is I would look at if a company is successful, you're going to be able to find a strong marketing organization involved in that growth. So I guess I just turn it around. I think companies that don't do well is because one of the reasons is because they have not taken in the contributions, the strategic value that a marketing organization can bring to the team and so forth. So that's something that's very key to us. Our marketing team is involved in sales activities. They go in the field and meet specifically with customers. 
they build a rapport with customers because, as I said earlier, one of the things that's key to us is having our, our customers talk about us, and our marketing team is able to put them in a position. To be Do all your marketers talk to customers? Pretty much. I think that's awesome because you would be surprised at how many times I will ask marketing people when was the last time they actually spoke with a customer, met with a customer, and you'd be surprised how few of them actually have that opportunity. Well, you know what? That's a fair statement. There is resistance to that, even in the early days of Revion Arts. There's resistance. And it's the uncertainty, well, I have somebody else in the customer, what's going to happen? But our team has proven on more than one occasion that they actually – uh, make it stronger in relationship and so forth. So now, as I said, two weeks we have we have a two or three day customer conference where we speak very little. Our customers make presentations on how they're using the solution and the benefits of the solution and so forth. Marketing set all that up, and our salespeople help make those introductions happen. So, frankly, I don't know how you not do that today and compete. And remember who we compete with, as you said earlier: IBM, SAP, Oracle, and the big players. We compete with them globally. And we, this is what sets us apart. It's not just technology. I don't want to ramble, but if people think that technology is the only thing that wins and you don't apply the, the viewpoint of culture and benefits to the market and things like that, you're, you're not going to get your message across. So you've got to find ways to get the message across in a simple, straightforward fashion. You know, I really like something that you said. It really resonated with me, so I want to repeat it. And that is, if a company is not doing well, they might want to take a look and see whether or not they're really getting the strategic value from their marketing organization. It's not tactical. And that it was a really strong message, and I don't want to leave, lose that. But now that you're talking about strategic value and, and proving out what the marketing's contribution, are there some specific metrics beyond things like leads, but real metrics to your business in addition to this, this pipeline stuff that you expect marketing to report? That's a good question. So we start with, the analysis around, for example, what we are, what kind of impact we're having in the marketplace is mundane, sounds boring, but it's really not inbounds into our into our solution. When I came on the Red Oxus, I say every sales call began with a us picking up the phone. That's not the situation today. Most inbounds just come from our the customers who have now received our messaging and so forth. So we track those kinds of, that kind of data. We track the, the, and we can show the step up and increase in the inbounds. We track the RFPs that we're now appearing. We track, we track the number of articles that we are mentioned in that we didn't generate, things like that. So it's, it's more about trying to understand how we're influencing the market in that next ring of information. We're not having a drive at all. It's now taking on a life of its own. So we do track all of that. And then we also compare what our focus has been a lot on, on PR and in, in the analyst market as well to help us create this message from that standpoint. So we track the benefits of that, and we also, uh, the team looks at that versus the cost of other metrics, that other uh, messaging techniques we could have done and the money we save and so forth. So we have ROIs as most good firms do and so forth, and they're not contrived ROIs. If you can tell, I, I don't – we don't want to drink our own Kool-Aid. Cheryl and her team and Alice and so forth, they're very pragmatic in what's a good metric for us to follow from that standpoint. That's, that, that's really helpful. Thanks. So we're getting close to the end of our time together. And oh. I know. It went fast. So before uh, we close, there's a few things that I'm hoping that uh, on the personal front that you'd be willing to share with our audience. A little bit more about Revionics, who you serve and the problem you solve, and then particularly your path to CEO. <laughs> but, you can choose your choice. You choose which way you want to start. Well, I'll tell you about Revionics, and I, I just joke when people ask me. I, I've done some things for like the University of Texas, which I'm a graduate from, and the business school, and so forth. And I get that question: "Tell me how you got to where you got there." And I just raise my hands and go, "I don't know." <laughs> well, there's a saying: "Luck happens everywhere, but you have to be prepared for it." And so I've been fortunate to have the the mind to say yes at times, and fortunate to say, have the mindset to say no to some things. But uh, well, let me talk about Revionics. Revionics. It's a company that's been around since, uh, oh, that's 14 years. I think it was 2002 is when the company was founded. And the founder is still here, a great, great individual, and he's, he's uh, works very closely with me. But Revox provides the retail market with predictive analytics. It's used, we use AI and machine learning before, you know, those were the cool buzzwords to use. What it does, it allows the retailers, uh, enables them to price more effectively for both their customers, but also in a competitive environment that they uh, work in and for their bottom line. 
We are a global SaaS software company dealing with some of the largest retailers in the world, but we also help the smaller retailers, and that's where our business actually started from. We started small and grew to the bigger market, and so that's when we took people by surprise. But we also service the fastest growing segment of the retail market, and that's e-commerce. So we also work with e-commerce. Uh, I was recruited uh, to come to Revion. It's been eight years to help them jumpstart the business growth, and since then, through the hard and tireless work of a company full of people. We've grown our revenues by sevenfold. Uh, in 2010, when I came, we were in one country. We we're now in 18 countries and five continents, and I don't know how many different languages our portal's written in now. We process over 650 million calculations a week, over 2.7 billion calculations a month, and manage more than half a trillion dollars of revenue for our retail customers annually. And to top it all off, we were an early innovator in the SaaS market, not just in retail, but on a global basis in the general market. We've done very well and very pleased, uh, but it's been a measured growth along the way. Trying to get too far ahead of ourselves. And it's all been organic, and that's what's really, yeah. really amazing. And one of the reasons I'm so fortunate to have you as our guest, because you have really a great story about a trajectory of organic growth. It's an amazing story. Obviously, you didn't do it alone. Oh, no. You have a great team, but you brought a, a vision and a, a process and a view on how to do that. So as we were um, wrapping up, uh, maybe any lessons learned or insights you'd like to share? And if you have something you would recommend for uh, reading as people begin to think about 2019 that you think would be helpful to them, I'm sure they'd be interested in hearing well, that. I, that's a good question because I've actually been looking for the next next books to read. But basically, what, what I would say is this: is that as you're growing a company, or if you're in a leadership position in a company, don't be CEO, any level in this company, you need to be aware that you're constantly learning, and you're learning more from your your mistakes than your your successes. Oddly enough, as that sounds, and you need to find out what makes you your organization, your product portfolio, distinct, as I say, in the marketplace. What sets you apart from the rest? And amplify and focus on that. You need to be focused on your growth plans. They will evolve as you learn more. It's okay. You can adapt. But remain focused. Don't go too broad, too fast. Don't try to expand too quickly because you'll outgrow your organization's capabilities and processes, as I talked about earlier. And finally, the key for successful long-term growth is to achieve effective scalability. If you focus solely on the top line, you're going to miss the opportunities to build a strong foundation along the way. And as odd as it sounds, success will then lead to failure. So you got to do that along the way. Yes, I think one of the things that's important for companies is to remember to continue to reinvest. Oh, yeah. Invest in, in the people, invest in processes, invest in skills development, I mean, invest. Speaking of books, one that um, I'm in the in the thick of, might not be the right, right thing, but since you were mentioned uh, about learning from your mistakes, it's the gift of imperfection. Hey, you know, someone else told me about that. As well. yeah. You like it? Well, I just got started, okay. so I'm, I'm, it's a little too early to tell, but yes, well, so far, me, yes. Let me know what you think about it. Okay, so I'm going to put that on the list. Well, I think we're going to wrap up, and I really appreciate your time. Thank you again, and uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We look forward to you participating with us in the next episode. Have a great afternoon. You've been listening to another episode of SLMA Radio. With our rotating series of shows, this week it was Ready, Set, Grow, Laura Patterson. Tune in next week for another show with another host on the only show that brings you information about sales lead management.